In recent decades, millions of people have drifted away from Jesus and their Catholic faith. Sadly, many may never find their way back. I'm Tom Peterson, and I believe that God has called me to use my background in media to be a catalyst in the new evangelization. Our organization produces inspiring and creative evangelization messages that have helped lead hundreds of thousands of inactive Catholics, converts, agnostics, and atheists home to Jesus and His Holy Church. Join us as we travel across North America to bring you stories of heartbreak, redemption, and transformation as the Holy Spirit leads His people home. God has an extraordinary plan for each of our lives. He wants us to spend eternity in heaven with Him and bring as many people with us as possible. This is Catholics Come Home. Now, I welcome you to my home to hear their amazing stories. Welcome to Catholics Come Home. In this episode, we'll meet a couple from Baltimore. While he came from a French-Canadian family and was baptized Catholic, his mother eventually raised him as a strict Baptist. After high school, he attended Moody Bible Institute and became a youth director. His wife was raised in a Lutheran home in her youth. After marrying, this couple began their faith journey after reading more about the early church fathers. Their theological studies eventually led this young family into the Catholic faith. Like everybody else in this series, today's guest came home to the Catholic Church by responding to a call of the Holy Spirit. I'd like you to meet Joshua and Gabrielle Rystad. Joshua and Gabrielle, thank you for being on our program and welcome to our home. It's our pleasure, pleasure thank you. Here. Our viewers love to hear about childhood stories, where you grew up, what your family was like, what your faith background was like. So Gabrielle, if you will start and let us know about your childhood. Sure, I grew up in Florida. I am the oldest of four children. I have all brothers. Um, and we grew up in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Oh. So a lot of times when people think Lutheran, they think, you know, what it is today, right. um, but it's a conservative branch. So right. we grew up with uh, some understanding of the sacraments. We were baptized and confirmed as small children. Right. And then when I was in middle school, we moved from Florida to Maryland. So that was kind of an awkward time yeah. <laughs> to move at, yeah, as far as time. making friends and, and fitting in. Um, definitely was interesting. And we started homeschooling also after that. So we kind of began this new journey together as, as our family. And, and wow. I got really close with my brothers. I'm really close with my parents, I think. that Because you were with them all day long. Oh yeah, we were with them all the time. <laughs> and I think that that really helped to solidify our family uh, foundation, you know, that even as adults, we can still enjoy being close, but. Did you have any religious practices that you remember that strengthen your faith? And would you say you were really close in relationship with Christ or you just, you just kind of had a religious family and it ended there? We went to church every Sunday. We were involved in various ministries and my parents always set an example of serving. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't necessarily have any family traditions that were super strong at home, but we definitely all identify with our faith. Sure, and when you say Missouri Synod, Synod Lutheran, uh, conservative, conservative on the moral issues of our day, like pro-life and, and traditional marriage? Yes, very conservative okay. in those areas. Okay. And Great. that's, you know, part of that dovetailed with homeschooling too. So sure. we just had a very strong conservative background. Um, and then when I got to college, I kind of started meeting a bunch of other people with different um, faith backgrounds and starting to explore maybe there's a world outside of this really tiny corner of Lutheranism. And I'd say that's probably when my mind started being open really to. Sure, and Joshua, uh, where are you from and what was your family like growing up? I'm from the Baltimore area up in Maryland. So uh -huh. I grew up there, I uh, was born in Annapolis, uh, but my, my mother's side of the family's originally from uh, Maine. Uh, they're uh -huh. French Canadian. Uh -huh. And so she moved down to Maryland, uh, you know, marrying my, my father. So I grew up in that area, but my father left when I was a young child in an adulterous relationship. So it was a bit I'm tumultuous. So even though I'd been baptized Catholic as an infant, I wasn't raised in the church because my father was not, not religious. My mom had really left the faith in order to marry him. But a Baptist church reached out to her while, uh, you know, throughout that divorce and, you know, single mother trying to raise three kids. Yeah, I had two, two younger siblings, all in close succession. Um, 
and uh, they, they really helped her with uh, not just things of religion, but you know, food and, and all kinds God of bless support. Them. Yeah. So we started to go to Baptist church regularly when I was a kid. I think by the time I was eight, we were in, in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. So three Good. times a week. And we got you know, very enthusiastic about it. So I ended up feeling a, a call as a child to become a, a missionary and wow. uh, started doing in, in middle school. I was doing street witnessing and wow. I went up in the Baptist church. You often go up to the altar if you're going to commit your life to Christ. So I did that. I said, hey, everyone, I'm going to be a pastor as a church of like 2000 people. So, I, you know, I grew up with uh, my brother, my younger brother, Christopher, my younger sister, Mackenzie. We've all been very, very close. When I was approaching middle school, my mom got remarried. A uh, great guy uh, from that church uh, was a really a hero in providing for everyone. But Wonderful. he came with three three kids of his own, all about the same ages. Oh, and the so, Brady Bunch, huh? Yeah that, yeah, that blended family. It was a tumultuous time for all of us. I really think that the, the six of us are closer now than we were right. when we all lived <laughs> together. Well, of course. <laughs> uh, it was, it was a, you know, really a journey for everybody. As I'm entering high school, I went through a bout of just severe depression, um, uh, issues with, uh, with pornography and uh, cutting, suicidal tendencies, um, really dark time. Uh, my stepdad and I were on very poor terms and really kind of walked away from the faith then, but not intellectually. I never stopped believing in Christianity or in Christ, and the church we grew up in was very theological, but really uh, dis I disengaged. I went into a, a, a hole. I, possibly to protect myself, but sometimes it's a spiral. You start and you can't stop. And I really credit some close friends at that church, that youth group, to, for sticking sticking with me throughout that and pulling me through that. End of high school, I kind of recommitted, okay, I'm really going to do this pastor thing. I repent. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on it. So I uh, went to Bible college um, and uh, ended up getting a call as a youth pastor. Well, it's at, a Moody Bible college, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, Moody Bible yeah. Institute, but they had a, everyone knows Moody Bible from Chicago. Yeah. Uh, I applied to Moody Bible Institute in Chicago and they said, sorry, man, we're, we're full up. We can't take <laughs> you. But we have a, a satellite campus in Spokane, Washington. Oh. And so I looked at the letter and I said, Spokane, what's Spokane? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and ended up going out there. That campus is now closed since then, but uh, spent, spent two years at Moody Bible Institute and ended up working as, as a youth, youth pastor for about five. Um, so I did all the stuff with the high schoolers, small church, uh, stuff with the high schoolers, organizing stuff for the middle schoolers, assisting with preaching, that sort of thing. Wonderful. In a moment, find out what prompted Joshua and Gabrielle to discover more about the Catholic faith. But I've always been attracted to both the intellectual rigor and the mysticism in Catholicism. I'm in a good place in my life. And I'm energized by new adventures. I've got friends to laugh with. And a good relationship. But even though I'm kind of comfortable, I sometimes wonder, is there something more? Could God and church be what you're looking for? Come and see at catholicscomehome.com. I used to wonder if God really cared about me. Then I started praying and going to church. I realized that God in my life was the difference between occasionally being happy and finding lasting joy. If you're looking for something more, check out catholicscomehome.com. Joshua, we thank God that he brought you out of those dark times and teenage years and, and uh, was always there waiting for you to come back, and you did. Yes. And now you're in Bible Institute studying the faith. How did your paths cross? If you will tell us, Gabrielle, how you finally met and uh, where your life went uh, once you met. Sure. So we were both living in the same town. We actually grew up, we graduated from the same um, homeschool co-op. Uh, and you knew each other? We didn't know each other, oh. actually. Had all <laughs> the same friends. We had the same friends yeah. all through college. And we actually, some of those friends and I started a um, campus ministry group at our college. Wonderful. And we were doing all these different events. And we had this end of school year event that we did with a local church in the area with their young adult group. And so we go to this this event, and that's where I meet Joshua. Huh. Love at first sight? No, actually, like, <laughs> we just were we were just casually friends. Nice. Um, but then the the love came fairly quickly thereafter, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's awesome. When did you decide to get married, and how did your faith journey progress? 
Sure. Well, we, uh, I remember when we were just meeting each other really for the first time, had all these friends, we got to talking and realized we were both very committed to our faith and both wanted a large family and finding either of those two things at people our age is difficult, much less both. So we hit it off very quickly. We dated for about six months. We were engaged for about six months. Then we were married a little too fast for our family's taste. <laughs> but you knew God said he provided the right spouse for me and you knew it was the yeah. right person yes. and, and it Which was the wonderful. right timing i was finishing school and sure. so it was a natural say now you each yeah. had different faith backgrounds so how did you deal with that well that that was that was a little rocky mm. uh, i had i didn't know there were conservative lutherans when i met her oh. so mm -hmm. i was actually an eastern orthodox inquirer at the time while i was a oh. youth pastor and reading all these old books the, the beard i mean it fits in with these it, eastern it, it orthodox does. yeah yeah um, I was actually told by my, my senior pastor, I'm reading St. Ignatius of Antioch and the Didache, mm. he's like, you gotta be careful with all those church fathers, they're really Catholic. Uh, oh. <laughs> but when I found out there was conservative Lutherans, I was actually very attracted to that because they believe in sacraments and, and the liturgy, et cetera. So um, although she came to join me at that, at that uh, Bible church, which mm -hmm. is like Baptist light, once we had our, our daughter and we were having conversations about whether or not to baptize her, uh, I knew I had to quit that ministry job. Baptize her as an infant. As yes. an infant, so. yeah. Not, not at all, but as an infant. As yes. an infant, yeah. for her salvation, baptism yeah, now saves. Yeah. yeah, and uh, so I knew I had to quit that job and um, uh, mm. uh, make a change. Um, so it was it was rocky. She really wrestled with coming to that Baptist church. Mm -hmm. yep. and, uh, and after that, I really wrestled with uh, the efficacy of baptism and communion and whether to stay at that church. So we both we both had a hard time during that early period. Yeah. I know in your bio you said the early church fathers helped you to finally make a progression yes. toward Catholicism. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Well, he was studying theology and we're both very into reading. We read a lot. We talk a lot about what we read. So he would pass articles and sections of books along to me and I'd pass things back to him and, and we would just have these discussions and we started coming to more and more realizations that maybe there's there's truth to be found all in one place and we have little bits and pieces here where we are and as we we're going mm -hmm. along to different churches for a little while there in our early marriage we were kind of in a couple of places and we just started to wonder well maybe maybe there's something more mm -hmm. and uh, you had a little bit of eastern orthodoxy in your background was that an option to begin with and how did it turn into catholicism as the sure. real true church and your your goal yeah that that's a great question so I, I actually have friends who converted to eastern orthodoxy and have some friends who are deacons and priests mm -hmm. um, and i was very attracted to the fact that it's uh, it's so old and yet they they don't uh follow the pope right, right. so that was the pope was a don't stumbling block for me mm -hmm. yeah um and so I, I was very close to converting. The when you Eastern, say the stumbling, to clarify, the stumbling block becoming Eastern Orthodox because you believed in the hierarchy and the authority of the church. Not initially. So I, I mean, I believed in the the authority of the bishops, but wasn't quite ready to come along to to the to papacy. Rome, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I, I'd heard a lot of negative things about the papacy growing up. But and I almost became Eastern Orthodox. So then I met her and got derailed by Lutheranism because oh. they have the, they have the Western, you know, the, essentially the Latin Mass in English, mm -hmm. and it's beautiful. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I love the Western Rite. So uh, that delayed my conversion to Eastern Orthodoxy mm -hmm. long enough for me to fall in love with Western practices uh, of Mary, the Marian dogmas in mm -hmm. the West, and, and the, the papacy as well. Awesome. Yeah. Was it through reading, both of you as scholars, both of you as, as readers, that brought you into the Catholic? Did you study your way into the Catholic Church, or was it more of a heart thing, mm -hmm. or a little bit of both? I'd say it was probably 75% reading at least. Yeah. Um, there were some emotional things that happened along the way as well and just some very clear events. But for the most part, I think, especially as a couple, it, we read our way. We definitely read our way into it, but, but I've always been attracted to both the intellectual rigor and the mysticism in Catholicism mm -hmm. and can definitely point to some moments of uh, either heart-wrenching or, or very um, uh, uh, romantic moments and with spiritual. Catholicism. Yeah. yeah. Do you do you think there was one particular time when you both said we're going to become Catholic or was it a slower process than that? Uh, it was there was a moment. We yeah. my brother came to the church in 2019 Good. and I went to the Easter Vigil Mass where he was confirmed. And the next morning we were driving to our Lutheran church and I just was looking out the window and I said it's time. We need to become <laughs> Catholic and I'm just so 100% sure. Good for you. Sure. And he said, I've been waiting for two years for you to say that to me. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> That's awesome. 
how did you make the move? What was it like? What was going through your mind and your heart when you became Catholic? Wow. Uh, it was difficult. We were, for a very brief period of time, living with her parents in between rentals, knowing we were going to move. And at first we thought we were going to move. So Josh would go to Lutheran Seminary. And we knew converting to Catholicism was going to be very hard for our family. It was going to be hard for our church. And it also meant that I would never become a pastor. Um, and that was, that was a very difficult thing for, for us to go through as well. So it was rocky to decide when do we, when do we start this journey. Right. After consulting with some local priests, we decided, hey, we knew we were going to move uh, in the summer. And so after talking to some priests, we decided, hey, let's, let's wait and enter RCIA after that move. It'll be a clean break. Sure. Um, people knew we were converting, but it wasn't quite as traumatic deciding to kind of take this in, in stages. Um, don't know if that was the right or wrong decision on one hand. We knew what we needed to do, and sometimes the best thing to do is just, just go for it. Uh, but on the other hand, it was definitely um, better for family and friends easing into that. And in the long run, God's timing was always perfect, wasn't yes. it? Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. And what was going through your mind and your heart during this time of conversion? Um, I was just really convinced that this is what we needed to do. Awesome. And I think I had a harder time waiting to just do it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess because he'd been waiting around for me to. And did you have children at this point? We did. We were pregnant with our fourth. Awesome. So, so, so you all came in as a family to the church together? We did, yes. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Well, we praise God you studied your way into the church because, yeah. you know, the Catholic Church is the church started by Jesus himself and the fullness of truth. And if you look hard enough, you're going to find the truth. Yes. <laughs> and so we praise God that you made that journey. Coming up, you'll hear the conclusion of the Reistet's journey into Catholicism. There's a lot more just reverence and ceremony that we feel such a need to impart to our children especially. Have you ever had someone show you incredible, overwhelming kindness? You know, the kind of generosity that makes you feel kind of small and unworthy? Well, when it comes to our relationship with the Eucharist, we should probably feel the same way. Now, we know that the Eucharist is truly the body and blood of Jesus Christ, but how often do we stop to think about the price that was paid for us to be graced with such a gift? In order for Jesus to leave us his body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist, he first had to offer himself completely. Through his agonizing passion and death, the lamb was slain so the bread of life could be ours. Is our response one of fervent gratitude, or have we become apathetic and complacent? Jesus longs to nourish us with himself in the Eucharist. Do we long to receive this gift? Gabrielle and Joshua, you moved to Georgia, you became Catholic, your family entered the church, and life has been phenomenal ever since. <laughs> it's, it's been blessed. We've had trials and blessings yes. uh, since then, absolutely. We entered during the middle of the pandemic. Oh, uh, so recently. So that yeah. was an interesting transition, too. And it, uh, there's challenges with it. There's crosses, but there's also blessings as well. Indeed. Now that you're fully Catholic and you're, uh, all your children are baptized Catholic, what is new and different in your life? What are you doing to serve? And did you get gainful employment after you gave up being a pastor? Yeah, great questions. Uh, yes, I, I did find employment. I, I mostly made it, <laughs> made employment. I had a short stint in accounting for a large automotive retailer after I quit that job as a youth pastor. But uh, since then, uh, Gabrielle and I have started a couple of businesses. Uh, oh, so I run a digital marketing agency and uh, now an online education platform as well. Um, and that, you know, that more than provides for our family and, and our team, yeah. Wonderful. So God provided, even though your family was concerned about it, you trusted him and yes. he came through for you again. Yes, again, definitely. yes. And what things are you involved with at church or uh, I know you're busy being a homeschooling mom, <laughs> yeah. carried the tradition of your family. And how many children do you have? We have five. And congratulations on your new son. Oh, thank you. You have a new baby as well, very recently. Yes. We thank you for uh, your growing Catholic family. I often say that if Catholics <laughs> come home, can't help them back, we'll just have Catholics who have more kids. So <laughs> we'll right. fill the pews somehow. Tell me about uh, your life now as a Catholic married couple, when you go to mass together, when your family, what's different about mm -hmm. it than back in the day when you were in the Protestant churches? I think that 
for the most part, I mean, we've always gone to church every Sunday morning, even though it was different. Um, there's a lot more just reverence and ceremony that we feel such a need to impart to our children, especially that when you go to church, you, you listen and you behave and you have little cards for them to know the different parts of the mass. Because nice. it's really important for us to make not just going to church on Sunday uh, tradition, but to do the rosary together, to say devotions together, to talk about the lives of the saints. So faith is the center of your life. It's not just something you do on Sunday. Yes, Absolutely. definitely. Yeah. yeah. What was it like, Joshua, when you first received the Eucharist? Well, uh, it was more, more than time. I, I had been anxious to receive the Eucharist for years and years. Um, and then we were supposed to be welcomed into the church uh, on Easter, and it got delayed to Pentecost due to the pandemic. So. Um, it, it was, um, you know, like coming home. Yeah. yeah. Gabrielle, what was it like when you went into the confessional, the sacrament of reconciliation for the first time? Has to be weird and different for yeah. somebody who's a convert. What was going through your heart and mind at that time? I was so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't even know, like I felt so awkward about the whole process and our priest was very gracious and, and it was fine. And I would certainly, for friends who are not Catholic and say, well, how, how do you do confessions, you know, so much less than what you build it up in your head. And after that first time, it was Our human fear gets the best of us, but the priest is in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's a beautiful sacrament. It certainly gives our soul a fresh start, doesn't it? Yes. Absolutely. Um, when you talk to your family now about faith, are there opportunities where you've been able to share the beauty of Catholicism? And is there any uh, are there any stories of friends or family who are saying, hmm, never really understood it that way? Uh, certainly. I, I think almost all of our friends and family talk about religion regularly. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, our family and friends, they're all very religious um, in their different communities, and uh, we don't shy away from faith topics. Um, yeah. Just recently stayed up very late with uh, relatives and friends talking about religion, and almost always there's some comments, oh, I, hadn't, I didn't know that, or... Yeah. Uh, people asking us questions about things. But it sounds like it's a charitable conversation on both Certainly. sides where it's not yeah. an argument. It's more no. or less sharing of, hey, let's all grow closer to God and talk about it, huh? Yeah, Which absolutely. is beautiful. It's the way the world used to be back in the day. Now it's a little, <laughs> little tougher to share things, but mm -hmm. we yeah. shouldn't be afraid to share the, the truth uh, of the faith, but always do so with charity and love, huh? Absolutely. absolutely. When you look back at those years in the Missouri Synod Lutheran faith, mm -hmm. and you look back at your early uh, church years and different faith communities, what do you know now that you didn't know mm -hmm. back then, now that you're fully Catholic? I, I know this is home. And it's in Lutheranism, there's so much kind of the outer, you know, you have sort of the sacraments and you have sort of this and sort of that that's semi-traditional, but then it's like the, it stops and there's not that fulfillment there. Mm -hmm. Joshua? Yeah, I know that Holy Scripture has been interpreted by uh, amazing people throughout the centuries. Um, and uh, we have uh, this uh, deep, deep well of truth here in the Catholic faith. And it's, I can't exhaust it reading, you know, 66 books of the Protestant Bible, but um, uh, rather it's, it's something to swim in and drown in. Uh, I can't ever exhaust the Catholic faith. They praise God. And they say once we die and God willing are in heaven that we'll learn even more about God's plan yes. for salvation and faith and it'll all like peeling an onion. There are more and more layers that we discover uh, in, in, the, in the next life. So we praise God. Well, we thank God that you are open to faith. We thank God you came from great families that had uh, uh, spirituality and faith and belief yes. in God and uh, centering on Jesus Christ as a background, homeschooling. And uh, I, I thank God that you and your family are in the Catholic Church and you're helping your children uh, on their journey as well. Praise God and welcome home. Thanks thank so you. much, Tom. Let's talk about the virtues. Practicing the virtues helps us grow in holiness, renew our culture, and become the saints that God created us to be. This week, we'll focus on the virtue of zeal. Zeal or diligence is related to the beatitude, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. I just love this virtue. We all have various desires and hungers, but zeal helps us order our hunger toward God, and it gives us the diligence to seek to know, love, and serve God passionately, and to do good for others. Zeal kicks the ugly sin of sloth in the teeth. 
While sloth makes us lazy in our spiritual lives, zeal gives us the fervent, action-oriented desire to progress forward. And in doing so, we please God and find true joy and fulfillment in this earthly life. With zeal, we run in the direction of holiness. Zeal puts our love into action and strengthens our resolution to progress in virtue and sanctity. Some practical ways to grow in zeal. First, make spiritual things a priority each day. Prioritize prayer, scripture reading, silent time with our Lord, and serving others. Next, set spiritual goals for yourself and track your progress, perhaps with a wise and holy spiritual director. And finally, keep learning about your faith. Frequent the sacraments and spend time reading and studying. The more you know God, the more you'll love Him. The more you love Him, the more you'll zealously serve Him. Romans 12:11 exhorts, never flag in zeal. Be aglow with the Spirit, serve the Lord. Here's your opportunity to grow in faith and help Jesus save souls. Visit our CatholicsComeHome.org website and click on the shop tab. Here, you can discover our four brand new popular books to help you and those you love grow closer to Christ. The Willpower Advantage, Building Habits for Lasting Happiness, includes a personal spiritual audit and a customized plan to help you fight lifelong vices and find freedom in Christ. One Moment Can Change a Soul helps you guide family and friends home to the Catholic faith. Plus, two beautifully illustrated children's books to help your children or grandchildren stay close to Jesus. Epic, the story of Jesus' Holy Catholic Church and Santa's Priority, keeping Christ in Christmas. You can also order a car magnet to evangelize in traffic, evangelization cards, and DVDs with all of our best episodes of our international television series. If you have a question or want to tell us how Catholics Come Home has blessed someone you know, or you can financially help us blitz the secular airwaves with these powerful evangelicals, contact us at info at catholicscomehome.org or by mail. Catholics Come Home, P.O. Box 1802, Roswell, Georgia 30077. Please help Jesus save more souls. In their early years, both of our guests were raised in Protestant homes. As this married couple continued on their faith journey together, they discovered the beauty of church history and the early church fathers and would both become Catholic. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Catholics Come Home. Please keep the Rystedt family and all of us at Catholics Come Home in your prayers. Remember to fulfill your role in the new evangelization by helping to love somebody to heaven.